I have nothing to disclose. So the objectives of this talk are really to understand um, not only the different indications for the bowel conduits that can be made in kids, but also the types of conduits that can be used. Um, also understand complications, transitioning care again from the pediatric to adult team, and then uh, pitfalls when needing to reoperate on patients who may have a conduit like this. So bowel conduits are commonly used in the pediatric population, uh, mostly for patients who have chronic constipation. Um, they can be patients who are in a post-operative state or patients who have a congenital anomaly but haven't been operated on. The most common post-operative patients in the pediatric population include those who have been operated on for Hirschsprung's disease uh, as well as imperfect anus. And the congenital anomalies where they may not have had any kind of operation um, but still have chronic constipation are those with idiopathic constipation, neurogenic bowel, um, cystic fibrosis, spina bifida, and myelomeningocele. So the indications for a bowel conduit are really patients who suffer from chronic constipation who have failed uh, medical therapy. And medical therapy is usually um, a combination of enemas, stool softeners, and laxatives. Um, it's usually these patients are, have gone through trial and error with increasing and um, additive therapies and still suffer from significant chronic constipation. Um, the other population are patients who have incontinence, and this can either be incontinence from uh, a post-operative state, um, such as Hirschsprung's or imperfect anus, but it can also be a pseudo-incontinence where they have fecal impaction and then get the overflow diarrhea around it. So th these bowel conduits are basically used to give integrated, what's called integrated continent enemas, and um, these are used to achieve evacuation and maintain evacuation in these patients. And they really become a part of their normal routine and daily life, and they sort of build in when they're gonna do the enemas um, based on their life and their schedule. So there's uh, several different types of conduits for options. Um, the first one that probably is the most common is an appendicostomy, um, frequently called Malone, because that was the, he was the first one to describe it. It's basically a continent appendicostomy. Um, there's also a laparoscopic, and that, that was an open procedure described by Malone. Um, there's a laparoscopic version that's pretty common nowadays, and that may be with or without um, a continence valve. Um, and then in patients who don't have an appendix, then you can make a neo-appendix um, for an appendicostomy, and that can be either uh, using a colonic flap or an ileal conduit. Uh, and then the, the final option are cecostomy tubes, and these can be placed either fluoroscopically guided, they can be placed laparoscopic guided, open of course, um, and some examples are a chait tube, um, which I'll show you an example of in just a minute, and another type is a button that's pretty common. Um, this can be, instead of a regular tube that's left out, because then obviously you can disconnect the tubing and close it off and it's flat with the abdominal wall. So considerations in, um, in these types of patients are what type of conduit they have, where is the vascular supply, and where is the location of the stoma. So the Malone, um, again, it's an appendicostomy, and it's made by um, making a continent valve by imbricating the base of the appendix um, with the cecum around it, similar to a sort of a Nissen um, Imbrication. So this is another picture of it. And then the appendicostomy is brought out through the umbilicus, and the patient is able to insert a tube into the stoma at the umbilicus to administer the enema, and, and the tube can be removed in between administration of enemas. This is an illustration of a colonic flap. So this is when the appendix is not available. It can be that the appendix is used for another reason, like a uh, metrophenoff, or that the appendix has already been removed. And the idea is to take a piece of the anti-mesenteric wall but leave a pedicle of the wall for the vascular supply, and then you tub tubularize the, um, the flap there, keeping it, again, in continuity on the one side, and then, um, again, you can imbricate it so you can make a continence valve, 
and then the tubularized end is brought up to a location for a stoma. And you know, based on the length um, and where this is made in the colon, the stoma may be placed at the umbilicus or it may be placed elsewhere, like the right lower quadrant. So this is the ileal conduit called Monty or Yang Monty. Um, the idea here, again, this is for a patient where the appendix is not available, um, but basically to resect a section of the ileum, mid portion, keeping the vascular pedicle, opening the anti-mesenteric border, tubularizing it, again, maintaining the vascular pedicle, and then um, one end is inserted into the cecum, the other end, is used for the stoma. And again, location is really based on where, where the um, stoma can reach. So for the um, placement of artificial tubes, if a conduit's not gonna be made, this is an example of a chait button. So the chait has um, a pigtail, so it can be inserted through the abdominal wall into the cecum, and then a pigtail keeps it in place, uh, and it's flat on the abdominal wall. There are a variety of tubes that can be used in the cecum, obviously, um, for this purpose, but this is a common example of one. So stoma complications are all the usual stoma complications, um, but I would say the most common that are reported are um, leakage and uh, stricture and stenosis. Um, commonly, when the stomas are made, a tube is left in place for um, several weeks until the stoma is mature, and then the tube can be removed and placed just for um, administering the enemas. Um, but a common uh, problem of taking the tube out frequently is that there's stenosis around uh, the, the stoma itself. And this can be managed with dilating with Hagar dilators, usually just at the bedside or in the office. Um, but one risk of the dilations, especially if someone other than you are doing them, is that there can be perforation of the stoma. Um, another one is the, um, the leakage, and if the leakage can't be managed um, just with sort of local skin care and it's really a bother, then you either need to revise the continent valve on the stoma, or if it was made without one, uh, then you may need to place one. So potential complications that would require an operation are uh, potential bowel obstruction, and this can be with volvulus of the bowel around the conduit. Um, and this is a situation if a patient presents and there's concern for this, then you need to uh, rule out with a contrast study or CT scan of some kind. Um, and if it's unclear from the imaging what's going on, then you may need to explore them just to make sure. Transitioning to adult care, you know, the question is always timing. Um, a lot of pediatric surgeons manage their own patients with chronic constipation, but this isn't something that a lot of adult surgeons manage um, in the adult population. And so finding someone who is familiar with the conduits and how to uh, manage them, deal with the complications, and then transitioning that patient over. Timing is really institution dependent. I found based on where you are, they usually have some sort of age limit to say this is no longer a pediatric patient. And I think that's really the um, defining factor of timing for transition. Um, it's important to find someone who is aware of how to manage these enemas um, so that they can maintain the routine or change them up if they no longer are effective. So adult patients who have had a conduit made as a child may need surgery for other reasons. And um, this is where the adult surgeon, you know, may be going in blindly. A lot of times, you know, if you had the operation done as a 10-year-old child and you're now 25, you may not know what kind of conduit you have. And also, those operative records may not be available. And so the adult surgeon may, may, may be going into the situation blindly. Um, you know, the idea is, first of all, to just respect the vascular supply, um, to find it, locate it, and then protect it. If it's a situation where you can't protect it, or it's involved and needs to be removed, then, you know, you need to consider a, either making another conduit, or the option for making another conduit at a later date, versus putting in a tube, so they can continue using the enemas for management. So in summary, bowel conduits and tubes are used commonly in the pediatric population for patients with chronic constipation who have failed medical therapy. Um, they really become a part of their daily routine in achieving evacuation and, 
and um, staying uh, colon healthy. Um, so it's important to be familiar with the different types of conduits that exist, especially if you're entering a reoperative situation, um, being aware of where these conduits could be, uh, not only location, but vascular supply as well. And um, as an adult surgeon operating on a patient who has one of these in place, it's always good to be ready to have other options available if you need it. Any questions? <laughs>